This is the Patty Brennan Podcast. Protect your family, plan for retirement, and learn to be financially bulletproof with today's best financial strategies. Now, now, broadcasting from the U.S. headquarters of Key Financial, nationally ranked by Forbes and Barron's, here's your host, Patty Brennan. Patty Brennan. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Patty Brennan Show. Whether you have $20 or $20 million, this show is for those of you who want to protect, grow, and use your assets to live your very best lives. I am so excited to introduce the guest that we have today. Dr. Joe Coughlin is joining us from MIT. He flew in this morning to join us to talk about the work that he's doing in the Age Lab. Joe, welcome to the show. Patty, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I want you all to know that I'm like this wannabe, like geek, watching and listening to <laughs> Dr. Joe Coughlin. Uh, I've been up to the Age Lab. It's really been just a joy to learn from you and, and learn how we can make a difference in the lives of the people that we we work with. So, Joe, if you could, and by the way, let me kind of give you a little bit of background of you know, uh, of Dr. Coughlin. He's just unbelievable. He's obviously got his PhD. Uh, he's a ke- senior contributor to Forbes. In fact, you just wrote an article this morning for Forbes, yeah, right? Yeah, this morning on social isolation, a retirement risk that can truly kill you. Now, tell everybody the story that you told me about the... It's a horrific story, and it really um, kept me up late yeah. writing the piece. It's about this poor gentleman, that a Navy vet, a decorated Navy vet in his 50s, Um, worked full-time as a a defense contractor, traveled frequently, but his mother, who would call him on his birthday and frequently lived out of state in Texas, um, couldn't reach him. And she called the police. They said, well, you know, look, he travels a lot. He's an adult. We don't do uh, missing persons on that. Years go by. Years? Years. Three years, to be exact. They recently found him dead on his kitchen floor for the third Thanksgiving in a row. Social isolation kills. In fact, it's been equated in the literature as being the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Wow. And so the piece I wrote in in Forbes is really emphasizing that retirement planning, as you and I have talked about, Patty, needs to be about longevity planning. It's not just about financial security, but in fact, it's a new social security that we need to talk about. How do we stay engaged and have meaning and have people around us? To check in on us. Right. You know, it's it's all about providing that meaning, having that purpose, living more fulfilling lives. Yep. You know, in your book, The Longevity Economy, which is just for those of you out there, you got to get this book. It really <laughs> is talking about, you've talked about the trends that are occurring in America today and frankly, how businesses can take advantage of it right. and what we need to be aware of. And I found so many of the statistics you talked about so interesting and and really how we need to revisit this perception of retirement, of aging. Yep. Tell us more about that. Well, as, as you know, the, the premise of the book, and this is where a lot of people either chuckle or take umbrage, is that old age is made up. And by definition, retirement's pretty much made up as well. And if you recall, the, the whole idea of old age and retirement came out of British medical literature suggesting that you were born with or imbued with a certain amount of vital energy. And if you use this vital energy badly, which for your listeners means anything fun, um, <laughs> that, that slowly... Okay, you, I'm you, a dead duck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, worth, worth, life worth living. But if you used it badly, that slowly you would be drained of that energy. You would suddenly mm. no longer be a full glass. You'd be a glass half empty. And so you'd be so tired from this loss of energy that you would have to retire. Interesting. And there's this nice linear line of retirement to retirement homes to, for many of us that are old enough, remember the phrase, funeral homes. So these stories actually create narrative that we actually think are laws of physics, when in fact, frankly, the whole idea of retirement from work, retirement and loss of energy or time to rest are only about 100, 150 years old. That's fascinating. Yep. That is really fascinating. So, 
Tell me, you know, I, as, as I have learned, MIT is known for data, 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 right? Yep. So, and data to me... Technology is the answer, now what's your question? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. So, so, and, and what, what, what's cool about it and what I, I, I think is terrific is that the Age Lab at MIT is the third largest database mm-hmm. at MIT. So, you, over the years, you've pulled together information and data and, and applied that data and used your research to really bubble up interesting things, mm. even inventions. Right. So tell us more about that. What's the, like, what's the coolest piece of research that you think you've... Well, for, first on? off, as you know, the, the Age Lab is not just multidisciplinary, as in lots of psychologists and engineering and data science, as well as anthropology and medical sociology, political mm. science, if you will. But what we've really done is we're multidisciplinary, but also multi-domain. We want to learn about that new future of old age, the, the longevity economy, through the lens of the consumer, the user, the person, the family, if you will. So that means we're looking at transportation, we're looking at housing, caregiving, and of course, financial planning and retirement planning. So over the years, we've done work in all these areas and have amassed amazing data sets that have not just surveys and focus groups, But for instance, physiological data from the car, how stressed are you behind the wheel? Mm. Skin conductance, eye movement data, video data on how you respond to choosing financial products, to how you provide care, to how you drive the car of the future. So I'd say some of the most exciting things is the fact that we're able to integrate all these things into one vision of how people behave, what they want, how can businesses excite and delight, and how can families provide ideal care? You know, it's it's interesting because when you talk about retirement and you talk about old age, it is not a burden to be relieved. It's an opportunity to be created. Right. And it's so interesting because that's such an important focus that, that I have. I, I, maybe it's my nursing background, Dr. Joe, because I, I just really believe that we got to look at these things holistically, Absolutely. the whole person. Yeah. It's not just, you know, your money's really a means to an end. What exactly are we trying to accomplish? And this opportunity to be created that you talk about is so important. I literally just had an, a meeting yesterday with a scientist. He is a, a gentleman who's worked on cancer for his entire life and has made incredible discoveries. And he's in his late 60s. He's been so devoted to his work. And he's beginning to think about this thing called retirement. And he's kind of pushed it off, pushed it off, et cetera, thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. I right. don't know how I'll spend my time. It's also time. about his identity, not just his time. And it's been really important because I'm in encouraging that conversation because why retire if you're just, you know, going to watch TV, right? That's not the idea of an ideal retirement. And it was interesting because yesterday, thanks to you, I began to start asking him questions like, you know, one of of the questions I asked was your question, tell me, what are the little things that make you smile? Tell me more about your happy place. Like, if you think about what makes you happy, where are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? And I learned, and this client's been a client of mine for years, he loves collecting rocks. In fact, they travel all over the world. He's a big rock collector, and he's a woodworker. Hmm. He got so jazzed up talking about rocks. <laughs> it was it was the funniest thing. And his wife was like, oh, yeah, Patty, you should see our house. We got rocks from all. And it was just all of a sudden he began to think about what life in retirement is. And I, I basically asked the question, how much time do you have, you know, doing, doing the woodworking? He said, I don't have any time. No. So it was really cool to begin that visualization that I, that, that brainstorming in terms of what retirement looks like for him so that he can kind of seamlessly go in and, and begin doing those things that he really loves to do. It's amazing. I, I actually have a wood shop that I built in my basement, really? but I'm never there. Um, but also, do you get a kick out of this? Many of your listeners may identify with this. The majority of baby boomers consider themselves gourmet cooks. For those who have the resources, many of them build out very great gourmet kitchens. 
of which they never use because they're either not home, don't have the time, or whatever it might oh, be. Oh, yeah, we have a Harley. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go. I got yeah. a Harley right yeah. in my kitchen. You yeah. know, my husband loves to cook. He's yeah. there, et cetera. Ask me the last time we turned the thing on. Yeah, exactly. You know, same thing, yeah. right? Yeah, so we have all these visions and these ideas, and but but really, you know, taking the time to but, enjoy them. But I them. think that you, in the spirit of asking those questions, that, that to me is the essence of what, as you know, I've been calling longevity planning, which is not to tell people what they're going to do, not to ask for what their vague goals are going to be 20 or 30 years out, but to find out what makes them tick. What are the little things, as you say, that make them smile? Um, and, and often, sometimes even spouses don't even know. I mean, having the morning paper with a blueberry muffin could be you know, success for that day. Right, right. And you know, and your your point is well taken. They don't even know what retirement is going to look like, no, right? None of In us fact, do. You know, to be honest with you, I think that's part of my job. You know, I, I tell people all the time, we, we, I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've helped over a thousand people, you know, a, 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 you know, retire comfortably, seamlessly, and, you know, use their legacy, use their assets, right. again, to live their very best lives. You get to do it once. Yeah. <laughs> right? Exactly. So, you know, hopefully I can use the resources that we have, the experience that we have to make it as easy and fulfilling as it possibly can be. So one of the things that, that I think is also interesting that you've taught us, and again, I keep on referring to teaching us, thanks to uh, John Deal and the Hartford Group, we've, you know, and, and by the way, let me do a sidebar. Um, if you haven't listened to the podcast that John Deal and I did, yep. we did three podcasts earlier in the year. Uh, folks, if you're listening, they are the most popular podcasts we have on the program, and thousands of people are listening to this podcast right now. I'm really kind of surprised how viral this is becoming. And John Deal's podcasts are the most popular, again, through the work that Hartford is doing with MIT. They are leading the charge in helping people like me, advisors, you know, develop this model and become what I think is really going to be important for the future of providing a real service to well, our as clients. As you know, Hartford's been a longtime sponsor, but John and I are, are not just good friends, but co-conspirators and trying to, I would suggest, to push the industry, the financial services, the, the financial planning industry, to an entirely new frontier around longevity. It, you know, to, to steal from John, in many ways, money's like electricity. Mm -hmm. You absolutely need it to do everything you want to do. But that alone does not tell you what to do, how to do it, or what you're going to enjoy. And I, and I think the industry and, and the work that you're doing, Patty, and your advisors here, starting to chart, not just chart, to curate and coach and collaborate with the clients and outside services to envision what that future is going to be is indeed the future of longevity planning. It sure is. And and we're not going to do it in this podcast, but in, in another podcast, probably the second or the third, and we're going to record them today, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about some of those services that, that we've curated, curated and we found to be very helpful for people who are our clients and people who are listening. So that'll be a lot of fun. So one last thing in terms of, I, I also found it interesting in terms of your research and the difference between men and women uh. handle this thing called retirement. Um, I had people in earlier this week and it was really interesting. Very comfortable, very wealthy, CEO of a, of a company. And they're kind of really nervous about what it's going to be like to have him around. Yeah. Um, as I was thinking about today's podcast and that subject of men versus women, I was reminded that, you know, I was thinking about this weekend. I had a bunch of girlfriends who we all got together Friday night, went to the movies. I can't imagine our husbands doing that together. Yeah, guys aren't socialized that way. Yeah. So, yeah. So, what does that really mean in terms of this experience called retirement, and and what is the difference between men and women? So, as you know, I, I write for Forbes, and in a recent article I wrote on Forbes, I did a little bit of back of the envelope calculation that will scare perhaps a number of couples that are listening, particularly the wives, because in general um, we only spend six weeks hours during the week with our spouse. And that counts showers, bio breaks, eating, going to the grocery store, and everything else. Wow. If you retire Friday at 5 o'clock and show up Monday morning at home, 
you just went to 16 hours a day on average that you're going to be spending. <laughs> so I cannot tell you how many women I've interviewed in yeah. focus groups and the like going, I don't know who this person is on my couch, but he wants me to make him lunch and wants to know what we are going to be doing the rest of the day. Well, we have a schedule. I don't know who he may yeah, be. Yeah. So, oh, so there's a real... F- challenge there. But Patty, the the point about the difference between men and women and retirement is that, you know, you don't need to go to MIT to know there's a difference between boys and girls. But, and I know I'll catch flack from a lot of the men in the audience, women do more. And what I mean by do more, their roles are not just professional roles and and being a, a wife or a partner or even a mother. But they're also caregivers. They're doing the shopping. They're the chief financial officer of the house. Even if they don't make the money, they know where it's spent and how it's done. And also to your point about going out with the girls on Friday nights, they also are, the, in many cases, the chief social officer versus men. And even the millennials that I've been watching of recent date are pretty focused on that eight to 10 hour day during the day. And men more than women are more likely to use the phrase so after I know your name, the second question is, what do you do? And I would suggest in retirement, the two most scary words that mostly men have to articulate was, I was. Mm. So the first year is, well, I am. And after about a year, they look down at their shoes and they go, well, I was. And then they look to their spouse typically and say, well, we are, you know, what are we doing now? And and given the fact the highest divorce rate in the world is amongst the 50 plus so-called gray divorce, her response quite often is, I don't know what you do, but I no longer do it with you. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Wow. That is interesting. It is it is a a period of life where we redefine ourselves. Yes. Who are we? What's our purpose? What are we going to do with our lives and how do we add value to the people around us? And that's scary when you've done the same thing for 30 years, 40 years, et cetera. It's also interesting to think about it in terms of psychologically, women sort of are used to the drill, right? And are used to all of that, whereas men, I would imagine that depression really begins to set in. Yeah, because that that sense of identity, social network, and purpose is wrapped around the job. The other thing that women, why they come out differently in retirement is they see older age when they're far younger. They are the caregiver. They, they're, they're uh, shall we say, the ambassador of, of their parents and in-laws in many cases. The number one profile of a caregiver is first a spouse, but then secondly, the oldest adult daughter. Mm. And so she knows that this is not going to be all golf courses and beach walks. And so she, generally speaking, plans a little bit more ahead or, has, shall we say, has a more realistic vision of what those years are going to be. It is. It's a great point. I think a lot of people who come in to see us, and and a lot of people in general, are have an unrealistic expectation of what this thing yeah. called retirement is all about. John brought it out in our podcast. You know, there is just so much golf a person can play, yeah. and beaches you, that you can walk on. Well, you've and, heard me tease uh, your, uh-huh. your colleagues and fellow advisors. Mm-hmm. The new brochure cover is all going to be sitting at cafes along river walks, while other people that look exactly like <laughs> us are riding bikes going by. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. You know. Know what it's a farce right so what yeah. what is what does it really look like so i think that you know if you were to think about the mistakes that people make as they enter that phase or is there anything that your research has bubbled up in terms of What's the biggest mistake, people? I think probably the biggest one that comes to mind is underestimating, and this is a quote that I get over and over for people that have been living in retirement for a number of years, just how long it's going to be. Mm. It's a retirement in the classic sense of 62, 65, even frankly 70 is a long time. And even those of us who have passions and hobbies and, and maybe even do want to play golf, you have seven days a week. That freedom can be a sentence, if not Mm. understood, that you've got to fill in a lot of activities. And we typically have very short-term goals is the second mistake. We talk about, we're going to spend more time with the the grandkids. Well, all of us who have children know that by the time that kid gets to be 10, they're too busy to spend a lot of time with grandma and grandpa, unfortunately. Um, A trip to Disney, well, that's one week a year. Now, what about the other 51 weeks? And probably the, the, the third one is is that really knowing that they've got to work on their relationship with their spouse, you're a new and different person at that point. New career, new aspirations, new needs, be they health and emotional and the like. So time, 
knowing exactly what you're going to do, and really kind of renewing those vows as to what that next third of your adult life is going to be. It's it, I, What I love about your work is how you frame things in, in 8,000 days. And it, it really is a good, really important point because that's a long time. 8,000 days is from z- the age of zero to age 21. Right. A lot happens during that period of a person's life. Yep. Well, the, the if you think about life being four segments of 8,000 days and retirement being the last one, imagine that life of zero to 21, yep. except you're an adult yep. in your 60s and your 70s. Or envision, you know, it's a little closer right, as you're an adult, that, that period from 21 to the late 40s, so-called Ooh. midlife crisis. Yeah. I mean, in between, you had education, maybe marriage, children, two or three houses along the way. That's the same amount of time we have to plan for in retirement. You know, a lot of people think about retirement being just about, you know, the financial aspect of things. You know, and I do tell people, it is the most expensive thing you're ever going to buy. And and you don't try it on, you don't taste it, you don't take it for a test drive, and you don't do a walkthrough. How about that? And so we're making this up as we go along in some cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where it's hard. And that's where just having, you know, really an opportunity to brainstorm and, and really walk through what does it really look like. It's not just about the numbers. The yeah. numbers are important. We've talked about this before. That's table stakes, yes. right? Performance, you know, to me, that's Every advisor should be delivering performance, right? right? That's, that's, that's what we need to do. But it's more to me about outcome. What exactly are we delivering the performance for? What's your ideal outcome? And let's do some brainstorming in terms of what your life is going to look like and how this money is going to support that vision. And, and one of the things that's never really been done, because most people don't realize this, is that while there has been retirement, it has never been this context of longer lives, uh, families that are more fragmented and mobile and whatnot. So one of the great, I think, innovations that you do, Patty, and, and that others should do as well, is to ask the questions. So you're right. Money's the table stakes. But where are you going to live? What are you going to do? What makes you tick? Not just the, gee, I'm going to golf for God knows how many years and buy a place on the beach. But really, you know, for instance, how many spouses, and our research indicates not yeah. many, have actually had the conversation about where they're going to live in retirement? Well, you know, I was just going to say, Joe, you know, the, the, a lot of people move several times in right. retirement, yep. right? They buy that second home, they try it out, they live there, then they move back. So to ask those questions, not just once, but over and over again, because, you know, you might get one answer when they're 62 years old and quite a different answer when they're 72. Absolutely. The kids might have moved across the country. Um, you know, friends might have passed away. They might be having some health issues and they want to move closer. I had a client who, you you know, lived at the beach, and they realized that they were pretty far away from, you know, g- good medical care. So they ended up moving into an area that they never anticipated. Uh, is it something you may, you may find fun, but it'll also give your listeners a way of thinking about it, to your point, is I think that there's probably at least three moves in that latter 8,000 days. There's the classic downsize, the house is too big, or yes, we want to move to the beach. But then what you just described, I call the right size, which is maybe one is uh, one of us is ill or wants to be closer to the adult children. So they ricochet back to the Northeast after having lived in Florida or Arizona. And then sadly, eventually one of us is going to be solo size. So think about that. We've never really envisioned three moves in retirement. Our parents didn't do that generally, and our grandparents certainly did not. So today's planner, today's retiree, these folks are hacking or charting a whole new f- uh, frontier of longevity. And they're, they're winging it. A yes, lot of times absolutely. they're just winging it. And that's where it gets dangerous. Because once you retire, you pretty much have whatever you're going to have. Yep. And then it's a matter of how that spends out. Right. So modeling those things. You know, I believe that there's always a solution. I believe you can pretty much have whatever it is that you want. It's just a matter of being thoughtful about it and making sure that you've pulled the different resources and are realistic about what's, what's okay and what's not the boundaries, the guardrails, right? right? Um, Well, 
Dr. Joe, I can't thank you enough. This has been phenomenal. Um, we're going to be talking about some additional things. Again, I want to put this, as you say so well, we're going to give you bites, not breakfast, right? <laughs> right. Give it to you yep. a little bit at a time. And folks, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to have one of the leading uh, it, you know, researchers in America talk about something that really isn't being talked about enough. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to go to our website at keyfinancialinc.com. Thank you so much for joining us again. I'm Patty Brennan, and we will see you again real soon. Thanks for listening to the Patty Brennan Podcast, brought to you by Key Financial, where wisdom and caring drive exceptional results for you, our client. Securities offered through Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Insurance services offered through Patricia Brennan are independent of Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. Advisory services offered through Key Financial Incorporated, a registered investment advisor not affiliated with Royal Alliance Associates Incorporated. The Barron's Winner Circle Top 100 and the Barron's Winner Circle Top 1200 are select groups of individuals who are screened on a number of different criteria. Among factors, the survey takes into consideration the overall size and success of practices, the quality of service provided to the clients, adherence to high standards of industry regulatory compliance, and leadership and best practices of wealth management. Portfolio performance is not a factor. Please see www.barons.com for more information. The Forbes ranking of America's top wealth advisors is based on an algorithm of qualitative and quantitative data, rating thousands of wealth advisors with a minimum of seven years of experience and weighing factors like revenue trends, assets under management, compliance records, industry experience, and best practices learned through telephone and in-person interviews. There is no fee in exchange for rankings. 